The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody. My name is Elena G. Levine, and it is my delight today to present to you a webinar supported and sponsored by the American Geophysical Union Career Center. Today we're going to be talking about women in geosciences improving your chance for success. This is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart for many reasons, one of which is because I am, surprise, surprise, a woman. So today we're going to be talking about all sorts of different opportunities that you can take advantage of to move your career into the stratosphere and to make sure that any stumbling blocks are pushed out of the way or dealt with when they, are potentially, uh, when they potentially show themselves. Before I begin, I just want to give you a couple of housekeeping issue, uh, uh, inform pieces of information. First of all, if for whatever reason you can't see the screen, just go ahead and close out your GoToWebinar console and just reload it. And if you have any questions, you can put them in the question box, and I'll be taking questions at the end. Also, I will be producing a companion article that will accompany this um, webinar, um, which will be put on the AGU Career Center website. We're also going to be recording this webinar, so you can watch it later as well. And if you have questions either during the webinar that I either don't get a chance to answer or after the webinar, please email me and I will address those questions anonymously in that companion article. And then finally, if you're having trouble hearing me, just go ahead and, again, the same type of thing, close everything out and restart and everything should be fine. So let's go ahead and kick this out and let's get started. So first of all, what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be talking about current circumstances in geosciences, in science, and in the larger um, realm of things, the business of science. We're going to be addressing certain attitudes, viewpoints, and perceptions. We're going to look at verbal and nonverbal communication that both women and men can take to move their career forward or potentially stall their career. And we want to make sure we uh, remedy these immediately. And then we're going to discuss actual major actions that you can take to move your career forward. So, first of all, surprise, surprise, you are a woman. Hooray for the ladies, ladies. Now, what this means is you may be a wife, you may be a mother, you may dress differently than men, you may think differently, you may approach problems differently, you have different interests. You see the commonality here? The key word here is different. It doesn't mean that you are better than a man. It doesn't mean that a man is better than you. Don't let anybody tell you either of those is true because they're not. It simply means that you and a man, so you as a woman versus a man, are different. You approach things differently. And there's nothing wrong with that. We have to celebrate that because that's the entire makeup of who we are. So be aware that you are different. Be a celebratory of who you are and what makes you different and make sure that you um, actually leverage those differences to move forward in your career and also to move the scholarship of geosciences and science in general forward too. So let's address the, the current circumstances that exist right now. We've all heard these before. First of all, women tend to make less money than men in most fields. And that this does not mean um, uh, just in science, but no matter what industry, no matter what job, we find men making more money than women. And there's a very specific reason for that, and I'm going to get to it. You probably know the answer already. The other issue that we're dealing with is that women tend to be in less leadership and managerial roles than men in many industries. This is in academia where we see more, more department heads being men than women. This is on major projects and grant proposals where most of the uh, leaders are men. I see this in astronomy where most of the observatories are run by men. We see this across the spectrum of STEM and in industries beyond academia and in academia as well. And there's very specific reasons for that too, and we're going to get to that as well. But I just want to lay this out for you so you know what the real deal is so that we can address that. So let's talk about some misperceptions of men versus women in science and business. And so I'm going to be talking a lot about the, the world of business, quote unquote business. I'm going to use that word a lot. And what I really want to just emphasize to you is that when I say business, I mean anything. Because science is a business, academia is a business, and many of you have heard me speak, talk, have heard me talk about the idea that you know in academia there's a product. A product is the education, the diploma, 
um, and the, uh, the scholarship of scientific research that is generated for a customer, which could be students, it could be a granting agency, it could be a no numerous other types of customers. But even academia is a business. And so you are in business, and so I want you to approach this from a business point of view. So now we've heard a lot of misperceptions, or we've heard a lot of words that are described about, that are used to describe both men and women in business and in science. And so we hear men being described as being aggressive or formidable, commanding, confident, authoritative, leading, communicative. And then the same situation where it's a, it's a woman in the same, let's say, the same position, speaking the same way or saying the same things, people describe her differently. And in this case, they're actually devaluing her expertise because she is described as being complaining or whining or witchy or another word that you know what I'm thinking about that begins with a B, or questioning or passive or bragging or troublemaking. And I just want you to be aware that this is not something that you're going to be able to personally combat or personally fix, I should say. You're not, you will be able to combat it. You won't be able to fix this personally in society and through various cultures too. But what we can do is make sure that when we stand up for ourselves, when we stand up for geoscience, when we stand up for science, when we stand up for our community, that people see us as being confident, authoritative, leading, communicative, aggressive, formidable, and commanding, and not complaining and whining. And if we hear people being described that way, it is our responsibility, both men and women, it is our responsibility to cut that to the curb, to stop that that speech, to stop people in their tracks and say, excuse me, that is not appropriate to describe this person. And we have to make sure that we do that. So that is an action that you can take, and we're going to be talking more about that. Okay, so more about attitudes and viewpoints. As I mentioned, we're in a business. And what's most importantly that you do when you are in a business, no matter what that business is, is you absolutely have to be professional at all times. Now, being professional means that you are serious about your craft, and that seriousness echoes in everything that you do, in the speech that you use, in the language that you use, in the vocabulary that you use, in the way that you speak, in the way that you dress, in the way that you act. And we want to make sure that when people are judging our authoritativeness, judging our expertise, judging our talent, that the first thing they see is that we are serious about our craft. Sorry about that that we are serious about our craft and that we are excited about what we're doing. Hold on a second, I apologize. Sorry, a little bit of a... Okay, there we go. Um, that we are serious about our craft, that we are dedicated to our profession, and the way we show this is by ensuring that people... Sorry, I apologize. I have to make something weird. Okay, all right. Hold on a second, sorry about this, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, and so but what I was saying was you want to make sure that people see you as being professional at all times so that they see your talent, they see your expertise, but they don't see anything else. And the reason this is important is because perception equals truth in the minds of the publics. And as many of you have heard me say, the publics consist of everybody, including your twin and your clone. So what they perceive you as is what they think is the truth about you. So they have to perceive you as being a professional. If they see you as a professional, as a leader, as an authority in this field, in your field, this will gain you access to opportunities to advance your career, to advance the careers of the people around you, and to advance scholarship itself. Your actions and your non-actions determine your future. And that's what we're talking about today, is what can we do to make sure that our future is the way we want it to be, especially in the face of sexism, potential sexual harassment, and issues concerning women not getting uh, opportunities uh, as much as men, or women seemingly not getting as many opportunities as men might. So there are some mistakes that some women make, and I want to bring those to the forefront. We're talking honestly today, so let's be honest. First of all, the biggest mistake that some women make in their careers in science and in business in general is they keep quiet. They don't speak up. They don't speak up about their career, they don't speak up, up, up about what they need, they don't, they just are literally quiet 
In other words, their voice is very soft. You can't really hear them unless you're standing right next to them. They don't speak authoritatively about their area of expertise. They don't ask for opportunities. They don't seek opportunities. They don't suggest um, solutions when there's groups of people. Perhaps in, in a group, they, they might feel that they don't want to upset the apple cart, and so they remain quiet. Um, they also remain quiet when they see injustices happening. Now, this, of course, happens with men, too, right? Men keep quiet when they see injustices. But right now, today, we're talking about the ladies. And so what I want to make sure is that you, if you see an injustice happening in other people's careers, in your career, in the environment in which you are doing your business, which is geosciences, that you don't keep quiet. But the most important thing that you can do for yourself is to enunciate what your needs are to the people around you and to clarify what your value is and what your, specifically what your brand is, which is your promise of value. And so you can make sure that you get the opportunities that will enhance your career and also enhance the scholarship of geosciences. Many mistakes, other, other women make mistakes in terms of not taking charge of their career. Um, they let they sort of go with the ebb and flow of things. You know, they, they go from postdoc to postdoc to postdoc. Men do this too as well. Um, but they don't necessarily take advantage take charge of their career and recognize it's your career, not your PI's career, not your boss's career, not your partner's career. It is your career. You have to stand up for yourself. You have to make sure that people know about your scholarly, your scientific outputs. If you're giving a talk, you have to let people know. You have to invite people. If you're, giving, if you're going to be uh, at a poster, you have to tweet that out. You have to communicate to people to let them know you are there. So make sure that you articulate. This is a big, big thing for yourself. And for anybody who's listening today, you now know that most, many women, not most, excuse me, many women don't articulate their authority, expertise, and credentials in the same way that men do. And part of that is because they think that it's bragging. Part of it is cultural norms where it's not appropriate to do it that it's consider, consider, considered to be something like bragging. But I want to give you an example of, of a time when this actually happened to me. I was talking to somebody, and they, were, they gave me a great example of the point of not articulating your authority and what that could potentially mean for your career. So many years ago, I was working for the University of Arizona. And I started running, I was doing some work for the dean of, of the College of Science, where I was running a master's program that combined science and business. And part of my job was to communicate the value of the program to industry leaders and to bring industry to campus to hire my students. And so I created this event called Dialogues for Success, Women Leaders in Science and Business, where once a year I would invite any student on campus to come to a dinner that I was able to get a grant for. It. And we had at the dinner five or six or seven women who were successful in science and also had been successful in business. Many of them had risen through administrative positions in academia, or they were department heads in academia. Many of them were people who had gone on to start their own company or were in leaders and administrators and managers within private industry or nonprofit or government agencies. And we were talking about this very issue about how some women don't articulate. They don't tell people what it is that they are awesome in because they're afraid they're going to sound like they are bragging about themselves. Whereas men tend to do that more often. Men are almost trained in a certain respect from birth <laughs> that you have to tell people what your value is if you're going to get opportunities, if you're going to be able to market yourself for that next opportunity in your career. And so one of the women who was at this event raised her hand and said, you know what? I was talking with one of my protégés recently. And we were just having a casual conversation. And I said, he said, how is it going with your career development? You know, how is it going with your uh, job searching and so on and so forth? And she said, it's going pretty good. And so I asked her, what is, this was the woman speaking, I asked my protege, what have you been saying about yourself to get interviews, to try and convert conversations and networking into interviews? And she's, the, the, the student, the young student, talked a little bit about what her authority was and what she had been doing and so on and so forth. But what she neglected to tell in her brand statement or elevator pitch or 30 second commercial or whatever you want to say, and what the leader found out later, what she neglected to say in her letters of interest, what she neglected to say in her cover letters, in any communication that she had with people, was that she had gotten a Fulbright to study abroad and do some research that resulted in a very important paper. 
she felt, this student felt, that she did not want to brag about the fact that she had a Fulbright scholarship and had gotten this paper, had done this paper that was very important because she thought that it, it, it shed poorly on her in terms of behavior and in terms of how people approached her and her attitude. And that is the exact opposite. I'm not suggesting to you today that you go out and scream to somebody, hey, I'm awesome. But if you have a particular credential, if you've gotten this particular rank, or if you have a first author paper in nature, or if you know this particular area of geosciences to a T, make sure that you let people know about that. It is not bragging. It is authentically communicating your expertise to people who can make decisions on that information. And those decisions could be in the form of job offers, leadership position offers, management position offers, offers to collaborate, offers to communicate your expertise to other leaders, and so on and so forth. So don't be quiet. Don't think that you are bragging. You have to authentically tell people what it is that you're good at if you are going to move forward and move science forward. Another mistake that some women make is they set a, what's called a success set point, or success upper limit. In other words, okay, if I become a professor, or if I get this particular postdoc, or if I do this in geosciences, I have hit my mark. I've hit my goals, so I'm not going to move forward anymore. I'm not going to do anything else that's going to move me beyond that. And as a result, what happens is, is that many women hit a midpoint in their career, a mid-career point, where they're not going any farther and they're not moving any farther in part because of non-action on their part because they don't, they reach that goal and they don't see any reason to go forward. And they think that if they do go forward, if they were to go to the next level, they would be seen as an imposter or they would think of themselves as an imposter or a fraud. I can't necessarily do that particular fellowship. I can do this fellowship, but I can't do that great fellowship because I am not good enough for that. Somebody else would get it. Somebody else should get it. Or, I'm an imposter. I'm a fraud. I'm not as good as this person, so they should get it. They should not me. And we want to eliminate that faulty thinking. That is false thinking. To think at any point in our career that we are an imposter, that we are a fraud. Because guess what, ladies? If you chose, and you did choose, if you chose to study geosciences and pursue a career based on geosciences, whether it's in academia or not, that immediately makes you extremely intelligent, hardworking, you are formative, you are a leader. You can't pursue one of the hardest subjects on the planet in the history of humankind, uh, which we know is only about, what, 5,000 years old, right, ladies? A little bit of a joke there. You cannot produce that or pursue a career in that if you were not a success, if you were not an expert, if you were not intelligent and hardworking and so on and so forth. So there's nothing fraudulent about your expertise. You are not an imposter. You can find a goal. You can set a goal for yourself. And when you reach that goal, look for the next goal. Look for three goals beyond that. Keep that strategic plan going forward in your mind so that you can always find a next goal and a next goal and a next goal. Now, another, thing that, another mistake that some women make is they think that when you are encountering inappropriate actions, such as sexism or sexual harassment, whether it's blatant or not, we're going to talk more about that in a moment, that you have to accept it if you want to advance or save your career. And that is, that is crap, okay? That is not appropriate thinking for somebody as successful as you. So I want you to remove that faulty thinking from your brain and start recognizing that if somebody acts inappropriate, if they say a sexist remark, if they are sexually harassing you, or somebody around you, if you witness sexual harassment, you do not have to accept it. You have a right, a God-given right, okay, a human right to say no. And if you want to move forward in your career, I want you to recognize that no is going to be your most powerful ally. Being able to say that, because it will give you confidence to know that if something is happening that doesn't feel right, doesn't seem right, and isn't right, you have the right to say no. You know, many years ago, I went on a uh, business luncheon. So I went to a lunch with a gentleman. I thought he was a gentleman. It turned out he wasn't a gentleman in any sense of the word. Um, so I went on a business lunch with this person. And my goal was, of course, to communicate to him why he might be a partner, a strategic partner 
for the university and for my students. In fact, I was inviting him to give a talk in a class that I was teaching on entrepreneurship for scientists and engineers. So we, he, we had met, agreed to meet at a, a restaurant that was his choice, um, and we were sitting down, we're having lunch, and we're just talking about business, quote unquote business. In other words, we're talking about science, we're talking about my career, we're talking about his career. We were talking about totally normal, totally appropriate, totally professional questions and comments and ideas. And then suddenly there was a pause, and then really honestly, lady, ladies and gentlemen listening here today, that this person then decided to talk to me and share with me his affinity and his enjoyment, I'm going to be honest with you here, his enjoyment of erotic pictures. He actually said that. Let me tell you a little bit about one of my hobbies. I enjoy looking at erotic pictures. He actually started discussing that with me. And I was sitting there, and I was very young at the time, and I'm thinking, OMG, what the heck is going on? One minute I'm talking about science and inviting him to come speak to my class about his success in business, and the next minute he is talking about pornography to me, to a lady in a restaurant. That is completely inappropriate. So I, admittedly, ladies and gentlemen, I froze for a moment because I didn't know what the heck was going on. I mean, I couldn't pull my head around it. I couldn't wrap my head around what was going on. And for a moment, I was embarrassed. And I was thinking, well, what should I do? Should I say anything? Should I get out of there? What should I do? And then you know what? The switch hit in my brain. This is not right. This man, this person has no right to be speaking to me about this subject in this forum. Maybe he can speak to his wife about it in the privacy of their own home. Maybe he can talk to his buddies about it. But in a business lunch, when we're talking about science, for goodness sake, he has no right to be discussing that. And I'm going to call him on that. So I said, you know what, excuse me. I don't think that that's an appropriate thing for us to be discussing right now. If you'd like to discuss it, I will be happy to leave our lunch. But if you'd not like to discuss it, if you'd like to move on to a more important topic, then let's continue. But we're not going to be discussing this anymore. And the man looked at me, his eyes were wide, he was shocked, and I saw his, his face got all red, he was immediately embarrassed, he apologized, and we continued on with the lunch. And to be honest, I never spoke to him ever again. So I could have done that lunch a, a number of different ways. I could have stood up and said, you were not going to talk to me that way, and just walked away. I could have done it any number of ways. And this is another message that I want to send to you, for all of you listening here that what the way I do something and the way I combat sexual harassment or sexism or anything of this nature is not necessarily going to be the one-size-fits-all answer. In other words, I am not telling you to do it my way. I'm telling you to recognize it and know that you have a right to say no, and you have a right to be able to act on that inappropriateness in the way that you think is appropriate for you at that time. It's your decision your life, it's your choice, it's your career. So I could have chosen to do it a different way, that's my decision, but I wanted to just give you an example of somebody speaking inappropriately and me, a lady, saying that that basically I'm not going to take that. And we moved on to the, from the conversation as I mentioned to you, but I don't want you to think, like I said, that every choice that I make or every choice that somebody makes, you have to emulate, you have to um, basically follow it because everybody has the right to make their own choice and to accept or not accept or act or not act based on what they have happened, what they are seeing and experiencing at that particular moment. And this relates to the next point on the slide, which is the mistake that some women make in defining your success using someone else's dictionary. This is actually a paraphrase of a quote from a woman. Her name is Star Jones. She is a lawyer. She used to be on TV. She used to be on a show called The View in the United States. Um, so she was very successful. And she had a quote that said, I will not define, something like this, I will not define myself, or I am defined by the dictionary, <laughs> I'm going to mess this up, I define myself by a dictionary that I am the writer of. Basically, that was the quote, that, was the quote, that I write the dictionary that defines my success. And that goes for you as well. You are all individuals. You don't have to take a yardstick or a meter stick and compare your career to somebody else or compare your action or non-action or whatever to somebody else. You decide what's successful. What is success? And if success for you is reaching point A in your career, then that's perfectly fine. If for somebody else it is reaching Z 
or T or A or whatever, or, or uh, L, that's fine too, because only I get to make the decision as to what I consider to be success. And what we don't want you to do, and this is removing the faulty thinking, what I don't want you to do is take into account, or you could take into account what your mentor suggests, absolutely, but I don't want you to only sort of keep that as the only thing that helps you decide what is successful for you. You know, many years ago, I've told this story many times when I was graduating with my math degree, I went to my advisor and I said, what can I do with my math degree besides going on to graduate school and becoming a professor? And the, my advisor turned to me and said, there's nothing. You know, there's nothing you can do with a math degree except go to become a professor or become a teacher or go into actuarial studies. And of course, it's ludicrous thinking. It's ludicrous thinking because with a STEM degree and geoscience is, expand, is it certainly included under that umbrella, you'll have the potential to do many, many different things. And I've talked a lot about this in other webinars. So what I had to do was recognize that this guy, this particular advisor, was kind of, he wasn't exactly a moron, but he had his eyes and he had his mind only in one direction. He had been on the pipeline for academia his entire career, and he never saw outside that pipeline. So he did not know what other careers, he literally did not know what other careers there were. And he defined success only by, as someone who was becoming a professor. But if you define success as something else, that's totally fine for you. And that's what I want you to remember, okay? Now let's talk about sexual harassment, okay? Because this is an issue. And, you know, I have been, as a science writer, this has been all the discussion this past fall, there were a lots and lots of conversations about sexual harassment in particular in science writing. In fact, the National Association of Science Writers at their national conference in the fall devoted an entire session on, they called it the XX question. It was all about combating sexual harassment in science writing. So I know there's sexual harassment. I have, I have um, dealt with sexual harassment myself. That was an example with that idiot at the table. Um, so we know that science is an old boys network. Even with more women in various fields, it's still an old boys network. And we also know that your field, your subfield in geosciences, is teeny tiny. It's picometers wide, maybe even less than that. And so what I want you to be aware, and this goes back to that other idea about you defining your own success, is that sometimes in our careers we are thrown, and in fact I guarantee that every one of you listening to this now and forever will face a challenge in your career where your career has to take a turn. And it might be because this person or this circumstance is a negative issue or it could be a positive issue. But in either case, your career may have to take a turn away from where you thought success was or away from this particular subfield. You know, if you want to work for the greatest for the, the greatest particular person or who, the, the person who has the best reputation in your particular subfield and you find out that he is a pit a sexist pick. This is not somebody you're necessarily going to want to work for. But if your field is picometers wide, then what are you going to do? You have to start thinking beyond that. You have to start thinking about where else can I find success and, and happiness and bliss for myself. Maybe not working for this idiot, maybe not working for Dr. Pig, but maybe working for somebody else. So I do recognize that your field is picometers wide and that people do talk. But I want you to think about that in a positive way, not necessarily a negative way. But also in a positive way, because people talk, you may be able to find out who the harassers are before you take an appointment with them, whether it's a postdoc or a professorship or a job in industry or government or what have you. You know, many years ago, I was really certain, um, after I graduated with my math degree and I got into um, the business of science communications for a little bit, I decided that I wanted to go back to graduate school in a particular topic. And um, I, my area of interest was in um, mathematics, and in particular history of mathematics, and in particular the history of mathematics in, um, in, in Arab cultures, in particular medieval Muslim mathematics and Muslim mathematicians. And the reason I got interested in that was I had studied abroad in Cairo on a Department of Defense Fellowship. I'm not bragging, I'm just communicating what I, what I did. And I got very interested in Islamic mathematicians and Islamic math and the history of math in that area. So I started talking to people who I had taken classes with in this field um, to find out who is the guy, who is the doctor god in the field of Islamic mathematics. And they told me about this particular guy, that you got to 
you got to study with Dr. Bot. If you want to, you want to be in muscle mathematics, you have to study with Dr. Bot. I said, great, this is terrific. So I started reading all of his papers, and I started looking at his uh, writings on the internet, and and um, you know, seeing where he was giving talks at conferences and so on and so forth. And then one day at the University of Arizona, somebody in my network emailed me and said, Elena, Dr. Bob is going to be coming to the U of A. He's going to be giving a talk at this colloquium. We'd like to invite you. We know you're interested in him and, and his work. Please come to the talk. Please come and um, uh, have uh, come to the networking reception after the talk. And I, I thought this was fantastic. This was great. I'm finally going to meet Dr. God, and I'll be able to work with him and introduce myself to him. So I saw him speak. I went to the colloquium. And somebody went up and introduced me to him, which I thought was very nice. Hi, I'm Elena. Uh, this is Elena Levine. She's very interested in this. Hi, I'm Elena. I introduced myself. And literally the second sentence out of his work mouth was a racist statement to me. So he made not a sexist statement. He made a racist statement to me that was incredibly insulting. And I was amazed. I was floored in the middle of the audience. I mean, you know, there were like five or six people around this group who heard him say that. And they all shut their mouths. They didn't say anything because this was Dr. God. This was their guest. You know, so you're not going to say anything if he says something racist. I was amazed. I was just absolutely shocked. Um, and quite honestly, because I was so young. At that point, I was younger than I had been with that other guy. I didn't even know what to do. And I said, you know what? Excuse me. I have to leave. And I just left. And I was in tears. I was so upset. Um, and the first, my first thought, and this is the faulty thinking that some women have, my first thought was that I did something wrong. Maybe I, oh, you know what? He didn't say something racist to me. You know, he just was trying to be funny. Or, no, he didn't say something racist to me. He was just um, miscommunicating. Maybe it was a cultural issue. No, I, you know, I'm giving myself excuses for this pig. This guy was not a Dr. God. He was a Dr. Pig. And I'm giving myself excuses, and then I'm blaming myself for misunderstanding what he was actually trying to say. And I don't want you to have that experience. If somebody says racist something to you, if somebody says something sexist to you, if somebody, if somebody attempts to harass you sexually, you are not um, uh, imagining this. This is actually happening. So don't blame yourself, first of all, and don't give excuses for the other person. They know what they're doing. They know exactly what they're doing. So I was very glad at the end, at the conclusion of this in my mind, when I finally closed the book and was done with this, I recognized I was not going to be able to work with this person. And I was very, very glad that this person revealed his true colors in a situation like this, where I had not already moved and committed to work with him. I had not moved my life to that city or to that university. And I found out later that he was a racist SOB. So I was really glad that he had shown his true colors at that event. And so what I did in my mind after that was, first of all, I never talked to that person again. And when I did have private conversations with people, and they said, oh, what do you think about this person? I said, well, let me tell you what happened with this person. So I was very honest with people individually about what had, had happened. And I wouldn't necessarily give them an explanation. I wouldn't necessarily give them a translation. I would say this is what happened. And I recognized that even though I wanted to study this very, very small field of mathematical history, that that was not going to be possible because this guy was the star of the field. And so this is what I mean about your field being picometers wide and, be, and also being aware that you can be successful in other realms. I realized that I would not be able to do this. I would not be able to study this particular subfield of mathematical history. And therefore, I moved my mind into other things to see what else I could be successful at, what else I would enjoy. I expanded that dictionary that defines my own dictionary. So this is a lesson for you about thinking about, even though your field is picometers wide, and you may have to leave that subfield because of pigs and zombies and losers that are in that field, that's OK, because you will find success elsewhere. Now, let's talk about sexual harassment, about whether you can spot it. There's overt sexual harassment, comments, jokes, literally touching somebody inappropriately. And then there's also the quieter sneak kind, where it's slipped into discussion, with subversive commentary. You know, And maybe it's a comment about, oh, you look so pretty. Or, oh, yeah, you're talking to somebody at a, a networking function at a conference. 
you're talking about your paper and your expertise in this area of geophysics, and they're looking at you in the eyes, and they say, you know what, you have the most beautiful eyes. Well, that's a lovely comment. Thank you for mentioning that. Wow, um, I thought we were talking about science right here. I didn't realize we were on a dating event. You know, that's where people get sneaky. That's where they try to slip it into the conversation. And then there's also stupidity, where somebody is just being an idiot, a moron, because they don't understand social encounters. And this we find a lot with nerds, in both men and female nerds. They just don't know the um, certain things that they shouldn't be doing, which is why if somebody does something that's inappropriate, you have the right to say, this is inappropriate. So I just wanted you to be aware of the overt, the sneaky, and the stupidity in terms of sexual harassment, because those are the different layers that you can use when you're by analyzing a particular um, scenario that you might encounter or that your colleagues might encounter, and then you can use that to figure out how you would act. But do not ignore your internal alarms. Your internal alarms, your gut instinct, is freaking awesome. It is amazing what your stomach, what your head, what your face will tell your brain, even if your brain can't catch it immediately. If they're talking about how pretty you look in that dress at a scientific conference, that's not necessarily appropriate. We can talk about that later. We, maybe if we're at a dance, maybe it's appropriate. After all, men and women are attracted to each other. Women and women are attracted to each other. Men and men are attracted to each other, and so on and so forth. And they meet at conferences. So there is going to be some of this uh, courting at conferences, and that's OK if that's the type of environment. But if you just gave a talk and somebody comes up to you and says, you know what, that's a great dress, and that's the only thing they talk to you about, then that's sort of that sneaky, quiet, subversive sexual harassment that we have to stop, OK? And if that happens to you, by the way, and you get that internal alarm, you can take a moment. You don't have to act immediately. You can stop, think for a moment, look them in the face, and if you realize at that moment when you're, if your brain has reached the, the, uh, um, the message, or if you've gotten the message from your brain that this is not appropriate, you can say, you know what, I'd be happy to talk to you about this paper that I just did, if that's what's of interest to you. And then they might realize that they should be ashamed of bringing up that topic, or being overt, or being subversive in the way they spoke to you. You should never be ashamed of yourself. They should be ashamed of their behavior. So you have to be able to speak up and say, you know what, I'd be happy to talk to uh, you about this subject. Doesn't mean that you have to scream at them and say, hey, you pig, how dare you talk to me like that? You don't have to do that. You might want to do that. Depends on the circumstance. Again, this is your decision, not mine. It depends on the circumstance. It depends on the situation. It depends on the person. It depends on how you're feeling that day, too. Um, it just depends. But you should not be ashamed. And if you are feeling ashamed, I want you to pull yourself out of that quickly and get used to pulling yourself out of that quickly. They're the ones who behave like a pig, not you. I want to just point out about the idea of somebody being stupid as opposed to somebody subversively or overtly trying to be harass you in a sexual manner. So at one of these uh, events that I held that I mentioned to you a little while ago where I had these successful women in science and business come and speak to students, I uh, invited a particular engineer. She's an electrical engineer who runs her own company. She launched her own company. She runs her own company. And she's very, very successful. And her company is very successful. And she's a very talented engineer. And because of her business, she is often in a room with only men. Uh, that is just the nature of her business. There are very few women in that particular industry, and that in particular, that particular area of engineering in that particular industry. So she's often interacting with only men in the room. So one day she, she, she shared this story with us. One day she was in a sort of, sort of a board meeting or a team meeting with various men from different companies and, and, and also government agencies and her team, which consisted of her and a number of men from her company. And you know, we were, the, the team was still sort of sitting down and chatting. And the team leader stood up and to break the ice, because in this case he was a moron, not a pig, but a moron, he decided to tell a joke that was a little bit sexist. Now, of course, the irony of that is there's no such thing as something that's a little bit sexist. You're either sexist or not, right? OK, so he told a sexist joke as an icebreaker to this room of all men and one woman. One woman. 
And so the woman described the scenario where he tells this joke, thinking that he's going to be funny, and he's going to bring everybody together to make a joke about this. And suddenly, everybody is quiet and freaked out because they don't know what to do. They don't know whether they should laugh or scream or not say anything. And every eye turned to the woman in the room. They wanted to see what the woman was going to do before they reacted. Now, in this case, this talented, successful engineer and entrepreneur, she realized this guy was just being a moron. And in the case, the joke that he told, she actually thought was pretty funny. And she started laughing. And once she started laughing, everybody else started laughing. And the joke was over. The icebreaker was done. And they got down to business. And it, nothing, nothing, no major tragedy had to occur because somebody told a sexist joke in front of a woman or in front of men that, that find it inappropriate and offensive. And so what I wanted you to be aware of is, again, this is the story of a woman choosing to take control of the situation in her own way, number one. And number two, a woman deciding that this guy was not being offensive, he was not trying to be inappropriate, he was not trying to uh, sexually harass her. Or, or even sexually harass the men in the audience with this sexist joke. He was trying to be funny, and probably because he was a nerd and a businessman, he did not know what he was doing, and he thought this would be taken well, and as a result, he made it, uh, almost an idiot of himself, but she was able to smooth over the situation. So just be aware that there's morons out there, and you can deal with them in your own way. You can say, excuse me, that's not appropriate, and, and get on. Or you could just say, you know what, excuse me, I'm going to go get something to drink and just walk away from that. Okay, now we want to, like I said earlier, we want to keep it as professional as we possibly can. But if they don't, right, if you're trying to keep it professional, if they can't keep it professional, if they don't keep it professional, meaning they, meaning the person who is perpetrating this harassment upon you, you have to stand up for yourself. And as I mentioned, this comes in many, many forms. But what is most important for you to remember is that your career, your productivity, your mental health, are all on the line. So you do not have to take it. You do not have to ingest it and hold it into your body and just stand there while somebody is being offensive to you and harassing you. You have the right to say no, as I said about that. And what does it say about this person and their organization if they are overtly walking around telling not just sexist jokes, but being sexually harassing, touching women or touching men in inappropriate ways, giving back massages to strangers, what does it say about the person? What does it say about who works for them? What does it say about the organization that probably knows about that and condones that behavior? This tells you information that this might not be the type of company, organization, or even department that you want to be working for. If they don't share the same values as you, you should not be working for them. Now, well, I can answer any other questions about sexual harassment, but I want to talk to you about some issues that we as women can avoid when we want to demonstrate our professionalism. Now, one of those areas is, in, is related to speech, communications, and language. Now, <clears throat> an area, excuse me, that a lot of women must avoid, that all women must avoid, is two things that really annoy me, and I bet they annoy you too. One is called a creaky voice or a vocal fry, and one is ending sentences with a question-like tone. Like, we're talking about science, but I want to share about why my paper in Nature is so important, but yet I'm ending my sentences, my authoritative sentences about my amazing expertise with a question. And when I do that, it causes people not to take me as seriously as they should. I want to be seen as an authoritative figure, as a leader, as an expert. And so watch yourself with those sentences. Make sure they don't end the question. Make sure they end very authoritatively and succinctly. Now, the creaky voice or vocal fry, you hear this in singers and pop singers. You hear this with a lot of teenagers in the United States right now. I'm going to try and do it for you, and hopefully I'll do it right. It's a glottal stop. It's adding pieces of it. It's basically adding chunks of air to a statement or to a word, rather than and extending the length of the word, rather than actually just saying the word. So. Like, um, like we're going to try to do this. It's something like that. I apologize. I can't do it. But you can look it up. And it's like, ah, 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 ah. that's what it is. It's like a e -e 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 voice. And we hear teenagers doing this a lot. We see people doing this. 
And I often see young women doing this at conferences when they're talking to people. They end with a question-like tone, and they incorporate the vocal fry into their statements. And this makes you appear, right, perception equals truth, it makes you appear as being immature in your career. It makes you appear as not being successful, as not being professional, and we don't want that to be. We don't want that to be seen. We don't want them to perceive that. We also don't want you to speak too quietly. I see this a lot, particularly at the end of sentences. Like, you'll be having a conversation, but then the sentence will go very quiet. At the end of the sentence is when actually you should be your most authoritative. You need to end the sentence with a exclamation point in a certain respect, because that's the last thing they're going to hear. So make sure that you end your sentences loudly, not screaming, but loud enough that they hear you and they hear the confidence in your voice. And also, we want to avoid starting or fostering inappropriate conversations or allowing the continuation of conversations on inappropriate topics. Again, going back to that wonderful gentleman in the restaurant who wanted to talk to me about his fascination with erotic pictures. I, had the, I, I made the right choice to stop the conversation. If I had continued the conversation, if I had said, oh, that's interesting, and just tried to um, sort of swallow it and try to ignore it, uh, it would have continued and it could have even gotten worse. And that person, that person who had started the conversation, when, he, when a person starts a conversation with you about an inappropriate topic, they are testing the waters with you. They're testing the waters to see, are you going to respond positively? Can they continue talking in this way? Can they continue talking about this topic? And if you allow it to continue, they will think that this is something that you enjoy or this is something that you want, and they may get the wrong idea about you. We don't want that to happen. We want them to only see you as a professional and as a lady. So we make sure that we, if, if an inappropriate conversation is started, that we stop it. And we are also going to be careful not to start one ourselves, okay? We're not going to go at a conference and have a conversation and start discussing, um, you know, people's body parts or inappropriate things about, uh, you know, about sex. We're not going to have it start a conversation at a geosciences conference and discuss sex. We shouldn't be discussing that. That should have no place at the conference. That should have no place in the conversation. But if you start the conversation, the other party, whoever they are, is going to think that it's okay for them to continue the conversation and to move the conversation even more deeply in that area. So we don't want that to happen. We want to make sure that you don't start a conversation about something inappropriate. You watch and be careful if you see something happening that it starts going into an in, a, in, an, in, in an inappropriate direction. You stop it and you get out of it. Now, the other thing that a lot of women don't do is or do is they engage in nonverbal communications, which communicates certain things about themselves or doesn't communicate certain things about themselves. And we want to make sure that again you're always seen very confidently. So when you're talking with people, look them straight in the eye. Look them straight in the eye. And you know, a common tactic that you can take is because there are two eyeballs, is you can look at them at the top of the bridge of their nose. So that way it looks like you're looking at both of them, in both of their eyes. But look at them in the eye. Stand straight with poise and confidence. And you know, I always say this. This is a challenge. It's, it's, it's hard, especially when you're in a negotiation. And I just did it now. Don't swallow. And what I mean by that is when you're in a negotiation or when you're trying to communicate that you are the authority or that you have value to this organization, if you swallow, that be, could be conceived as you thinking that you don't have as much authority or that you're thinking that, you know what, I'm not as smart as I think I, I I'm not as smart as I say, I'm saying that I am, or I'm hesitant or I'm not confident about what I'm speaking about. And so it's, it's hard to not swallow, especially when you're nervous in an environment, but if you get used to not swallowing, uh, especially at the junction, the really important junction like of the negotiation, like when you say, well, I think I'm worth X, don't swallow at that moment, then people think that you're a little bit more confident. Now, related to this also, these nonverbal communications is the ability and the necessity, especially for women, to dress appropriately and, quite honestly, conservatively for the experience and the circumstance. 
I'm going to go into the idea of displaying femininity in a moment. But I just want to point out, we often have this issue, I see this a lot with young, young students who don't know how to dress for an interview, whether it's in academia or not. Whether it's for a postdoc or grads, they go for, you know, they go for um, a graduate program interview or anything like that, they don't know how to dress. They wear a short skirt that's too short, they wear a shirt that's too low cut, they wear too much jewelry, they wear too much makeup, and the focus suddenly becomes on the body of the person and not the brain of the person. And we want them to always see you as the brain, as the talent, as the value that you can provide that organization, that graduate school, that graduate program, that postdoc appointment, and so on and so forth. So be very conservative in how you dress. You, now, this goes back to the issue of men and women are different. Men and women dress differently, okay? And you have the right to wear a dress. You can wear a skirt. I have a lot of women coming to me and saying, Elena, I'm always confused at conferences, especially when I'm giving a talk. Should I wear something with frills and flowers? I feel comfortable in it. I feel confident in it. But it is very feminine, and I don't want people to think of me as a feminine person. I want them to think of me as a scientist person and not a feminine person. But the truth of the matter is, is that many, many women are feminine. Femininity is a natural part of being a woman for most women. And as a result, many women will dress in a feminine way, which means ruffles and lace, appropriate lace, of course, and flowers. I do it, and there's nothing wrong with that. I wear dresses, I wear suits, I wear bright colors, reds, purples, and things like that when they're appropriate, when I'm giving a talk, when I'm doing an interview, when I'm having an important meeting with somebody, like a networking contact or somebody who could potentially be a collaborator, because I want them to see me as a professional. And it's okay to display aspects of your femininity. Wearing a low-cut blouse, that's not demonstrating femininity. That is dressing inappropriately. So there's a difference between dressing inappropriately and dressing seductively as if you were going out on a date, which this is not, versus dressing like the female scientist that you are. And the female scientist that you are means that you can dress in skirts, in dresses, and in flowers. There's nothing wrong with that. But what I always do say is you do need to know what is considered to be conservative and what is considered to be appropriate for the experience, the circumstance. You know, if you're giving a talk at a conference, I always say, even if most of the audience is dressed like at AGU, dressed in jeans and maybe like a jacket or something or, or a button-down shirt, I always say you should kick it up a notch. Wear a, 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 like a nice skirt, like a chino skirt, skirt and, and a nice jacket and a nice button-down shirt. If you're interviewing for a job, if it's appropriate, wear a suit. You know, do these things so that people see you first as the brain, as the talent, as the professional, and not as something else. But of course, that depends on the, um, the culture that you're in as well. So now I wanted to go over some major actions that you can take as a woman in science to make sure that you can move forward in your career. The first action, of course, is negotiating. Always negotiate. The reason you want to always negotiate is because your first salary will determine every other salary for the rest of your life. And a lot of people, some men, some women, think, I'm not going to negotiate because First of all, A, they're going to be mad at me. They're going to rescind the offer. They will never do that. Ladies, they will never rescind the offer. They may go back and forth with you and stop at a certain point in the negotiation because they can't go any higher or because they don't want to go any higher, but they're never going to say, you know what, how dare you start to negotiate? The offer's rescinded. Be gone with you. That won't ever happen. And if, by the way, it does happen in some strange alternative multiverse you know, universe, this is not an organization or a person that you want to work for anyway. Um, another thing is that many women don't want to negotiate because they don't see that they're worth, how much they're worth on the market. You have a right, just like a man, you have a right to ask for what you are worth, what your market value is. And so you have to do a lot of research to find out what is this position, what is the range for this position, you know, for the salary, for the compensation package, in this type of a company, in this particular geographic area, because there are variants there. And I've talked a lot about negotiation, and I think I've even done a webinar for AGU on that. You can go back and take a look more in detail on that. But what I wanted to tell you is that most men know to negotiate. They just naturally negotiate. You need to start thinking naturally to negotiate as well. 
negotiation not only will get you a higher salary, but it demonstrates your attitude and your brand, your promise of value. It shows you as a hard worker. It shows you as somebody who's going to go to the mat. It shows you as somebody who's going to actually go and solve the problem. And this is and somebody who's confident in their expertise. And if you're not confident in your expertise, in your, mark, in your value and your market value, nobody else is going to be. So don't be afraid to stand up for what you are worth and be aware that others may not negotiate, but you can and you should. Another major action we need to do as women, we need to seek out and get and ask for and create leadership and management roles for ourselves. If they don't exist, you have to ask for them. If they still don't exist, you have to create them. This is very important for your advancement. You have to be seen as a leader and as an authority. So if you're going to move forward in your career, people give opportunities to people who they see as leaders. If I see you as a leader, if you're on my committee and you volunteer to chair the committee, and I see you as the chair doing all this great work and all these great outputs, I'm going to think of you as a leader. I'm going to perceive you as a leader. I'm going to perceive you as a professional. And then I'm going to invite you to apply for hidden opportunities. Or I'm going to tell you about advertised opportunities, which could include jobs, appointments, other committee assignments, being on a journal, uh, editorial board, and so on and so forth. So look for opportunities to be a leader, to develop leadership skills, and then look for opportunities to promote the fact that you have a leadership ability or a leadership role. In other words, you're a member of AGU. If you're going to be, uh, if you've just taken over a chair position or if you've just received a leadership position or you've just be, received a management position in your organization, you could tell um, your, you know, your association and they could put it in the newsletter. You could tell your alumni association and they could put it in the alumni magazine. Tell people appropriately. Put it on your website. Put it on your LinkedIn profile. When you introduce yourself at conferences to, to new people during networking, communicate, yes, and I served as a leader, leadership role in this way. Or as the leader of this organization, I did X and Y. Remember, it's not bragging. It's communicating your authority in an authentic manner that makes allows somebody to make a decision on your information that you're giving. Another major action that we all must do, both men and women, we have to align ourselves with our female colleagues. This means we have to create and participate in a support system that supports our protégés, the people who are um, behind us, in other words, in our career, our compatriots, in other words, the people who are at the same career point or career level, and even our mentors, the people who are senior to us in their career point or advancement. We need to make sure that we support their interests, support their needs, we need to give them and share information about career and advancement opportunities, ideas for success, solutions for problems and challenges, including sexism, racism, and sexual harassment. And quite honestly, when you align with your female colleagues, you also will be sharing information about the haters, the zombies, and the pigs. Now, the pigs are those sexist pigs, those people who just are total they're essentially garbage, and they're not people that you want to work with, and all they think about is the fact that you are a female. That's the only thing on their mind. They're not serious in science. They may seem like they're serious, but all they're thinking about is you as a female as opposed to you as a scientist. The zombies are people who think they look like people, but they're actually not. They're creatures who exist only to eat your flesh, to eat your ideas, to suck the creative juice out of you, their survival is completely dependent on, your, on you being uh, thrown to the trash. And then the haters are people who basically say, you can't do that. You shouldn't do that. No, you can't do this and this together. No, nobody's ever done it that way before. And there will be people like that. And this is a major action that you have to be aware of. You have to be aware of the haters. If somebody says to you, you can't do that, and we're not talking about physics, we're talking about career advancement or career decisions, if they say you can't do that, identify in your brain that this may be a hater. They could be a moron, they're probably, they could be a pig, they might even be a zombie, but at first call they're probably a hater. So are they a hater? And if they are, we got to ignore them and move beyond them. Years ago somebody told me, Elena, 
I got I applied for a job. I didn't get the job. I went to my mentor, who was somebody who I thought was a mentor. It turned out he was a hater. And I said, why didn't I get this job? And he said, Elena, you know, at some point you're going to have to decide for yourself. You can't do science writing, professional speaking, and comedy. There's no way you can do all three of that. I'm sorry, you just can't do it. And you know what? That guy is a moron and he's a hater. And I do all three and I do a whole bunch more. And I, don't, I love what I do and I'm very happy that I do it. And I created many of the opportunities that I have. And I have seen many haters along the path who try to pull me down. And I learned to identify them. I learned to ignore them. And I learned to move beyond them. And I learned to just recognize, you know what? They are haters. They are in their own universe that is trapped and trapping them with hate and jealousy and upsetness for their own career failures or their own issues that they have. And they are projecting it on me. And I am not going to be a screen. I am not going to be a projection screen for their hate. Let their hate move on down the road. It's not my business. And then finally, I wanted to just re-emphasize and re-amplify the point of being professional. We talked about the way you dress, the way you act, the way you speak, what you say. But we didn't talk about cyberspace. And I love this quote. Cyberspace is forever space. So make sure that what you put on Facebook is appropriate, is professional. I know you think that it was cool that you went down to Cabo and got drunk and somebody took a picture of you totally drunk. And you, and you want to put that on Facebook for your friends to see. I know you think that's cool right now. But in 10 years, you're not going to think that's cool. Maybe in two minutes, you're not going to think that's cool. And your employers are not going to think that's cool. And any potential partners who see that, particularly men who see that, who are pigs, they're going to see that. And they're going to think something erroneous about you. They are going to think that you are not professional. We don't want them to see you in any other light except for the talent and the professional that you are. So make sure that you don't put any inappropriate um, pictures, no inappropriate texts, nothing about you as a female should be out there except for you giving a talk. A, a perfectly fine to post on Facebook is you giving a talk at a major conference like AGU wearing a pretty dress. There is nothing wrong with that. You are a woman. After all, if you enjoy wearing dresses, that's perfectly fine. That's appropriate. But you acting like a fool at Cabo is not appropriate and could reflect poorly on your brand and your reputation. And relating to being professional, of course, is also noting the cultural norms in which you are doing your business, your science, and respecting those cultural norms. When I studied abroad in Cairo, I acted differently. I certainly dressed differently. I spoke differently. And I spoke about different things than I did in Tucson, Arizona. And I recognized what those were, and I was respectful to the culture in which I was operating. So what you can do, you can speak up, right? This is what the key point of this talk today is, is you have to speak up. You have to speak confidently and authoritatively. You have to speak up for yourself, for your interests, your career, your goals, your area of science, your area of scholarship. And you have to speak up for your brethren. You have to speak up for others. And I hear this a lot. It, like, for example, I just came back from a major scientific conference where a number of women were talking about, you know what? If we see a woman, especially a young woman, being accosted inappropriately, being accosted at a conference by a pig, in other words, being either subversively or overtly harassed sexually, I am going to make a pledge to stand up. I am going to make a pledge to walk over to there excuse myself and say, excuse me, um, you know, Mary, whatever, let's go talk by ourselves. And remove that person. If they are unable to do it themselves because they are young and inexperienced, I'm going to make a pledge to do it myself. And this was a group of women that were standing up for themselves, for their brethren, as they were moving forward in their career. Because they recognized that when you align with others, the success is shared by everybody. So do that. Speak up. And don't worry about sounding like a witch. Or another word that rhymes with which and begins with a B, you are not a witch. You are being the same as a man. You are aggressive. You are authoritative. You are talented. You are commanding. You are a leader. You are a success. And you will act like it. And you will talk like it. And you will walk like it. That's who you are. You are awesome. And you don't have to apologize for that ever. And if somebody says to you, oh, you're being, oh, you're being catty or, oh, you're being a witch or something like that or how, why would you talk like that? You're such a witch. 
How could you how could you speak like that? Or how could you ask for that? That's such a witchy thing to do. This is somebody you don't want to be talking to. This is somebody you don't want to have business with. You have to ask for and create opportunities that you want and need, both for yourself and your brethren. You have to seek and create those support systems. You have to negotiate, negotiate, negotiate. Share the information with your colleagues. Enable that next generation of leaders and demonstrate your professionalism always. And if you see inappropriate behavior, you knock it to the curb right now. And you do that for two reasons. Number one, you're telling the other person, this is not the place to do that. We will not accept this behavior. And the more that person hears that or sees that kind of action from you and your brethren, the more they will know that that is not accepted and they won't do it to the next person. Okay, and that's number one. And number two, you have to demonstrate that you are a professional and you are confident and you're going to take command of the situation. And that demonstrates how intelligent and how authoritative you are. So with this, I thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you about this subject. As I mentioned, this is recorded today, so you'll be able to go back and, and view it again. I welcome you to connect with me. I have my own network of connections on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Twitter, and so on and so forth. I'm going to be sending you a follow-up email for this. And I know it's a little bit after our time, so if you have to go, that's no problem, because any questions that I'm going to take now, I will allow, <clears throat> excuse me, I will put in the companion article that will be on the AGU Career Center website in the coming weeks, so you'll be able to find out what those questions are and the answers. So I thank you all so much for this opportunity, and now I'm going to answer some questions, and we have some good questions <clears throat> that, came, that came in. So somebody asked, how do you suggest avoiding someone in a field because they keep making comments about my appearance and sending emails to meet up, which I ignore? I do not want to talk to him, but he's always around at conferences. So that's a great question, and I'm so glad you asked it. And so certainly at very small workshops, it's not going to be necessarily easy to avoid this person. If they are making inappropriate comments and there's not, no way that you can avoid talking to this person, you could privately either email them or privately look them in the eye, not in the middle of a networking function, but pull them off to the side. You know, can I talk to you for a second? And privately say, you know what, what you have been speaking to me about <clears throat> or what you have been discussing with me, what you've been emailing me, I don't consider appropriate. I would like to continue, if this is somebody you'd like to continue working with or somebody that you think you could potentially continue working with, and maybe they're just being a moron and not a pig, right? Maybe they're just not being thoughtful in terms of their communications. I, you can say to them, I'd like to continue working with you, but this type of discussion has to stop. I'm not going to discuss this with you anymore. Can we continue? And you're putting them on the spot, and they will be embarrassed, and they will be ashamed if they're a moron, and they will say, you know what, excuse me, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to insult you or offend you in any way. Yes, of course I'd like to continue. Let's go and continue. And they'll, believe me, they, they will never bring it up again. If they are a pig, you can still pull them aside and say, this is something that I'm not going to accept. I don't want to discuss this anymore. I don't want you emailing me about this anymore. If they are a pig and they continue it, then you will keep a paper trail. And if it comes to a point where they're being not just offensive and not just subversively sexually harassing you, but they're overtly sexually harassing you in a way that can influence your career advancement, then you may have to go to their supervisor. Which, quite honestly, may mean that you may have to either A, move out of that subfield, because if, they're, if, the, sun revol if the world revolves, if that subfield revolves around them, and everybody knows about their behavior, and where they accept it, and they, you know, or, and they accept it, or they don't know about it, but they're going to let it slide anyway because they're the sun and everybody else is a, a planet rotating around them, that might mean that you have to leave that subfield. Um, you can also just try avoiding them at conferences. You know, you, I would, how you, you said, how do you suggest avoiding someone? Don't go to their talk. If you see them at a mixer, walk across the room. Don't go to a mixer. Don't walk to a team, a group of people at a mixer where that person is already engaged. Walk across the room. Um, if it's a small room and there's nobody else, if there's only 10 people in the room and there's only one group of people discussing and he's there, you may have to leave the room. You know, but that, there are certain things that you're going to have to decide for yourself what you want to do. But it's your decision. 
And if this person continues harassing you, just keep that paper trail handy because it might be that you will have to communicate that to somebody who is in charge of that person so that they can take action. So at this point, I don't see any other questions, but if you do have any other questions, please email me. And like I said, I will respond to your questions anonymously in the article. In other words, I will remove the, any personal information um, pertaining to your situation so that your question is completely um, anonymous to anybody who's reading it. Um, you can continue sending questions, and I see a few more, but we are out of time. And I wanted to thank you so much for this opportunity. This is a privilege and an honor to be able to talk about this subject with such open-minded people as yourselves. And I want to thank, again, AGU Career Center for sponsoring this type of activity and these, <coughs> excuse me, these types of conversations and dialogues, which are very important, not just for individuals in science, but to move science forward. So thank you, AGU. Thank you, uh, colleagues. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This was a privilege. And we'll be doing another AGU Career Center webinar in the coming months, so stay tuned. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks again.